your network is so important. It really is. And, and, and the most extreme example of this is when somebody loses their job, they don't have a network. So they're groveling to all their friends. Right. right. And so, you know, there's no excuse for that today, especially in LinkedIn, you have to treat your, you know, you have to treat people like friends, you know, like really. And I think that there's been too much of an institutionalization that's been normalized now where, um, you know, coming after the pandemic, a lot of people are, they're looking for that warmth and that intricate connectivity. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Salvatore Buscemi is currently serving as the CEO and co-founding partner of HRN LLC. They are a private multifamily investment office, and he has demonstrated a keen eye for successful investment strategies. Sal, welcome to the show. Sam, it's a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you. Absolutely. The pleasure is truly mine, Sal. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes to the show. In 90 seconds or less, can you tell me, where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? I started out after college not wanting to go to medical school because I passed out holding a uh, tibula in the cadaver room. And I wound up networking uh, because of the work I did for that doctor before I passed out. Um, he had um, introduced me to his brother who had just made partner at a firm that I would later work at called Goldman Sachs. At the age of 29, I left and raised $30 million institutionally from a Park Avenue investment manager. Um, I was young. I was uh, looking back. I was very driven. But there was an opportunity with Bear Stearns that collapsed that I was able to utilize my skills and network to be able to put together a $30 million fund institutionally, which a lot of people don't do unless you have that Wall Street pedigree. And we had a lot of fun. Uh, the markets changed. And about 10 years ago, I started because of some of the families that I worked with. They, um, we went into life sciences because I was introduced to two partners of mine that have very um, illustrative careers in life sciences, um, managing money for the Rockefellers at the age of 26, 6 billion, you know, for them. And, you know, it's the same for Texas State uh, Pension uh, Teachers Pension Fund, too, as it related to um, the, um, you know, life sciences. So the deal flow that was coming in is great. And we built a whole consortium around that because a lot of people want to. Um, a lot of people have discretionary income and not only looking to place it into things like real estate, but also into other things that are a little more impact driven. That is a wild ride. Let's go back to the 30 million you raised right out of the gate uh, on yeah. your own. W what was that mm -hmm. into? That was into, it was, um, it was interesting. It was sort of like the big short, but not really. We were buying whole loans, right? Where if you look at the big short, they were looking at buying, you know, they were creating synthetics and then they were shorting them or trading them. So we were basically the kitchen sink for Bear Stearns. Um, a lot of the stuff that came through, and this was during 2008. Now, a lot of people at the time thought that you couldn't short the housing market. Well, movies and books have been written to show otherwise. Sure. But it was really uh, me connecting with someone who was a little older than me, but could uh, could see the fire in my eyes, I guess, um, enough so that, you know, we were we, we put together this um you know, this, this, this fund that we were able to um, buy a lot of defaulted assets from Bear Stearns and some other banks that were going out of business. Got it. And what, what did you do with them? So you bought all these defaulted loans and then what? Uh, we bought low and sold just a little higher. So what we were able to do is that we were able to clear title on these, the ones that we were going through the whole foreclosure process and then just selling them off to rehabbers. Got it. Right. And they had, a, and as long as, you know, and the key to make it, that really made that work, Sam, was to make sure you understood the metrics they wanted as far as a profitability. And then this way that would affect your investment basis. So if you know these guys had to have a margin of like, I'm just saying 35%, for example, it makes it a lot easier for you to go into these deals knowing exactly what these guys want. And it was high velocity and we were able to do that. And then later I did it out in Las Vegas too with, um, with commercial real estate, with private lenders. And I actually wrote my first book after that called Making the Yield because a lot of people didn't know what hard money lending was or private lending. Um, if you go to makingtheyield.com, you know, you can get a copy. But, um, and then after that, I wrote another book on fundraising because that was important too as well. People wanted to know, well, what was the right way of doing this? And uh, raising real money was actually, uh, came out about a year after that. What are, so you've done a lot. Let's just start there. I hear, I hear, <laughs> I hear the last twenty years, and I, I go. Oh, I like God. to say busy. I like to say busy. <laughs> <laughs> You've been busy, okay, yeah. and it sounds like it's busy by choice. What drives you today to keep doing what you're doing? Like, what's a what's a key motivator for you? So we're not. We haven't really done much in real estate. We do have a 166,000 square foot Class A industrial building we did in 2020, which has been performing very, very well because it's logistics and and you know, warehouse, light warehouse. 
but what gets me out of more out of bed in the morning right now is the impact that I've made and the track record that's starting, especially from this year. We've seen a lot of our again life science companies make a lot of improvements and strides as it relates to getting FDA approval for artificial um, defibrillation devices that every mother now will carry in her purse, right? You can charge it with your iPhone. That is a big deal. And that came out in February. We also have a few other things that are happening too, where people, um, where the ability to to really impact humanity is great. To, to a lot of these wealthier families, and the ones that I'm talking about are over $100 million in net worth, they, they're not looking for an extra zero, really. They're looking for that impact. They're looking for the bragging rights to go along with something. And we've been involved in a lot of deals right now where even outside of life sciences, we've had a tremendous impact in society. If you think about it, there's 260 million soccer players worldwide. We invested into a company uh, alongside another large family called AI Scout. And AI Scout is a preeminent recruiting tool. And you'll hear some announcements, but they've already been chosen uh, for Chelsea Football Club and um, a lot of the other Premier League sports te- Premier League football teams in Europe to be used for um, recruiting. And, you know, the impact that that has made is that in a town in East India where there's only one cell phone for 45 people, one kid was able to get recruited to Burnley, I think. So these are Premier soccer clubs that are doing a lot of recruitment and the impact and the democratization of people through technology to be able to improve their lives is something that you know, really, really draws to me, you know, it's like so I, somewhere I don't have any kids and I'm not married, but at some point, you know, you got to look back and see who did you help? You know, what did you really do? And I think most people look at it from the altruistic standpoint where, you know, but I look, I like to think big and I like to be alongside people who think just as big as I do to get into opportunities and to, and to really communicate the strategy in a way where everybody can get their, their hearts and minds around it. That is amazing. What do you do to put yourself or and maybe at this point, it just it's just the network that you've built. But how do you put yourself in front of these types of opportunities? Because those are pretty um, nuanced. They, you know, these are not my rule of thumb is the wider an opportunity is made available, the less valuable it is. Think about it. Everybody during the cryptocurrency days, you buy Bitcoin. Why not? Everybody's sneaking into your, you know, your DMs. I, I to us it's a function of your network but mostly your reputation if i did not do what i was supposed to be doing with this one company i would not have been invited to uh invest in spacex actually this past august right and so that was an opportunity where i had to move fast people could depend on me that we could move fast to do this and we come to the table with money so i think it's more or less a reputation where it's people are looking for that certainty of execution that you're actually going to write a check. You're going to do what you say you're going to do. You are who you say you're going to do. And you, and it's backed up by pedigree too, as we talked about. And that gives people the creature comfort to say, Hey, let's let Sal into this consortium. Let's let, you know, let's let them have a look. No, that doesn't mean I'm going to invest. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I get invited to things all the time, but even more so than that, what I like to do is I like to keep the networking on a very high level um, and a very active level. Tonight I'm invited to, Three things I don't want to, to, you know, cigars and and cognac. I mean, I'm just going to meet with a bunch of people real quick. You know, it's like a gathering here in Miami. But, you know, if I meet one person of consequence there or somebody who I can help, it's worth it, right? And it's just a short walk. And it's a very cool day in Miami today. So it's not like I'm going to be sweating on the way over there. There's other events too. And I moved to Miami because, and this is something I want your listeners to really understand. Your network is so important. It really is. And, and, and the most extreme example of this is when somebody loses their job, they don't have a network, so they're groveling to all their friends, right? right? And so, you know, there's no excuse for that today, especially in LinkedIn. You have to treat your, you know, you have to treat people like friends, you know, like really. And I think that there's been too much of an institutionalization that's been normalized now where, um, you know, coming after the pandemic, a lot of people are, they're looking for that warmth and that intricate connectivity. And, you know, that's a whole other, con- you know, a whole other conversation we can have on that. Right. No, I think that's great. That's absolutely great. Yeah. I mean, I'm re- reading here on your website or on your website, actually on your LinkedIn uh, profile view you know, or profile. It says, you know, you guys are multifamily office advisor and you put a bunch of things in there. And one of the, mm-hmm. one of the phrases I think that was unique was it says in other or, or not unique because you actually use the word in it, but was uh, catching was in other unique invitation only opportunities. And so I started thinking yeah. about like, okay, so what, what is Sal doing yeah. to get in yeah. front of those, you know, unique invitation only opportunities? Yeah, you're networking. You're always out there. And for people at home who don't live in Miami or New York City, where I'm from, you have Zoom today. There's it's there are people I know who open up their calendars just so they can sleep, (laughs) you know, where they're meeting with people all over the world. It sounds kind of crazy. And there are people who are eccentric who do that. You don't have to go that crazy. 
but it would be great if you could meet some people over Zoom just to, you know, to continue to build the network meaningfully, not just clicking and accept and, you know, people will forget. And also be interactive. I'm always interactive on people. Whenever I'm on a on a podcast, I always repost it. I always talk about the good things that are going on. I talk about a lot of things that are going on. Um, but that interactivity is more important, not just on LinkedIn, but also through email as well. Right. Absolutely. Let's let's talk about the something that we mentioned here in the beginning of the show. Uh, I said you've done a lot, and you said I like to you define it as busy. How do mm -hmm. you make sure that your busy is also meaningful? <laughs> I have two, that's a very good point. And you have to look at it and find out what's the highest and best use of your time and how do you leverage that activity? So I like to, first of all, number one, today we live in a digital age, right? And so every you have to continue to attract attention, whether you're me, whether you're someone else, uh, in the worst case scenario, politicians, they're constantly attracting attention, right? right. Because attention is the new oil. And, you know, there's 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 a lot to be said for that. So what I do is, the highest and best use of my time are two things. Number one, creating content to post on LinkedIn. I like LinkedIn. Twitter for me is like a knife fight. Like every time I post something, somebody, you know, I think people are drunk on Twitter, to be honest <laughs> with you. I, really, I just don't understand it. But it's, you know, it has it serves its purpose as far as, you know, democratizing the voice. The second thing, too, is that I'm always talking to investors, whether they're current or new. That's the highest and best use of time. Hmm. Current or new. And I'm being very careful about, you know, what they're telling me. If it's a new investor, what do they like to invest in? What don't they like to invest into? Sometimes they like investing in stuff we won't touch. That's fine. We can still be friends. But he's not going to get my email distributions, maybe. Right? So, I mean, it's, it's you just have to be meaningful and thoughtful about it because there's just so much noise out there today. And if you really are looking to build those relationships and you're sending out the emails and you're continuing to do things that really set you apart from everyone else, you're going to start to build a brand for yourself. And your brand really is your promise when you think nobody tells you that. They all have these great names. You know, if you were to ask Madison Avenue what a brand was, they, they'd say it's a nice logo. And I've been down these road. I know exactly what it looks like. But at the end of the day, people are investing in you and a brand first before they invest in any sort of entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we talked about that a little bit before we started hitting, hitting record, which was mm -hmm. you said that we've moved into this transactional sort of um, capital raising environment where people have lost that relationship edge. How yeah. again, you know, maybe I'll just ask the question again, maybe in a different way, but how do, how do you, that's a lot of high touch. I'll just say that in raising capital, in maintaining those relationships. How do you do that in a, in a way that's, that is scalable? Yeah. Um, today, I think less is more. When I moved to Miami a year ago, it was off of the, it was still during the tech hype and ether. A lot of people were on the tech ether and then Silicon Valley bank happened, right? What happened is, is that everybody who I'd meet would be a founder and it would scare me because they'd come and they'd have their iPad underneath their arm. And I'm like, oh no, I'm going to be pitched. Like, this is terrible. I have to sit through this guy's PowerPoint. And what I think happened is, and you could actually maybe chalk it up to the, to the Bitcoin era when that was supercharged was that people became very transactional and when you're dealing with people as you know if you're selling something like a book or you know even a car you know you, you it's it's very transactional you don't really have a relationship with your used car salesman right, right. however um when it comes to getting money from people people will never give you their money without first giving you their time they want to get to know you and this is something that goes back to biblical times that you know getting someone to part with their treasure for a higher calling is probably the highest calling there is in sales when you think about it um you know funding i mean look at what we're doing now raising money bundling for politicians war companies whatever there's a lot of power there and that's the highest and best skill set you could have it's not necessarily being a salesperson but being very social and being, you know, and building that network and really enjoying it. If you don't enjoy it, that's fine. Find someone who, who, who does, you know, maybe online you can help <laughs> to do that. Um, you know, with AI, I'm sure there's going to be all sorts of gimmickry that's going to be coming out with that. However, you got to make an effort. And I think if, you know, for me, if I make, you know, if I'm on the phone, I like meeting new people. I get introductions all the time because they do what I say I'm going to do. If you make an introduction to someone, I'm going to be there two minutes early before the Zoom to make sure everything works, um, just to make sure you don't look like an idiot, even if this guy doesn't do a, you know, a, even if this guy and I, you know, never do business together or anything like that, it's because it's a function of your re reputation. And people today, I don't think they really 
they don't value their reputation as much as they used to. I think they're hiding behind, you know, the pixelation of what they want the world to see as far as their Instagram and their social media. But the transactional nature um, has only accelerated. But in order to counter that, you have to go in the other direction. And when everybody zigs, you should probably zag. And that's just fundamental for all humans. I mean, nobody goes to the movie theater to read numbers. They all get there to be entertained and hear a story. Become a storyteller. People really like that. But it will also help you build your network. And then when the time comes where you need to make an ask for that network and you hold off as long as possible, then you're going to be um, pleasantly surprised. Hold off as long as possible? Yeah. I think a lot of people are saying, oh, I just met this person. I want to know, are they going to write a check? Well, they don't know you. They they barely know your company. You can't even communicate your company correctly. Um, it's too technical. It's too deep. It's too granular. It's confusing people. Why don't you build a relationship with this guy first and see if this is something he's really into rather than just treating like a an ATM. And for me, it's the more value you give someone first, um, the better off in a position you are. It's, it's the law of reciprocity reciprocation reciprocity and that's really what people are motivates people today you know it's like i send you a copy of my book right i mean thank you for having me on your podcast but you know like there's reciprocity there right i mean does it cost a little money yes i autograph it but it's something you'll always remember and um for those of you who are looking to raise money starting out writing a book could probably be the best thing you could ever do that's interesting. I love that. That's a great, that's a great tidbit. And, and, and it is, you're right. I mean, I'll be honest. I don't know what I've got episodes wise. And again, I'm not tooting my own horn here, but maybe 870 some odd episodes at this point. And wow, yeah. I remember every guest who has sent me a copy of their book. Yes. And that's, I mean, that's a lot. Maybe, I mean, not, not a lot, not, not a lot that I remember, but it's like, you know, there's probably five people maybe of that 870 that sent me a copy of the book and I can probably name them all off to you. I'm like, oh, they did, yeah. they did, they did, they did, they did. Yeah. And there's a lot of episodes, unfortunately, you know, cause this is quick. It's a 30 minute show. Not even, it's a 20 minute interview, a 30 minute at, at most where you and I might interact and to remember those people and go like, well, of, of the 870, I can name yeah. them off the top five. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty powerful. So I love that law of reciprocity. I hadn't even really thought about that until right now. Imagine bringing a book to an investment conference and just, I mean, I, I come with a bag and I just, with a Sharpie and I'll just sit there and, you know, if it's someone of consequence who I wanted to get to know, instead of giving them a business card, which everybody's going to forget or nobody really understands, you have a book here and you're like, huh, you know, and somebody else notices it. Well, what are you reading? And then it just goes around and then people wind up buying it for their friends and, you know, it becomes a good Christmas gift. Right. Oh, that's cool. That's very, very cool. And I think this is one of the things we really want to talk about on the show today was raising capital in, yeah. a, in a difficult capital raising environment. It sounds like that's one of the yeah. tools that really you're using to uh, help raise capital right now. It is. You know, a lot of people have come to me um, and they've asked and they, you know, a, a lot of the things that we've covered, but I think there's also some sort of um, people forget that especially new founders, we don't invest in new founders because there's a level of immaturity there that we don't, you know, they, they just don't have the experience, but we don't invest in new founders for several reasons. Um, because they're, you know, they're still learning the ways and they don't have the network to get out of trouble if they, you know, should get caught into any sort of financial trouble or if they need something. Um, we, I always send emails out, we, interactivity is the new currency today. And if you are not interacting with your investors on a regular basis, only when you're asking for money, giving them bad news or giving them a tax bill, you're really do you're not you're not doing this business correctly. That mm. everybody today, as I said before, you are your own brand. If you're raising capital, I don't care if it's for a life science company, I don't care what it's for. You need to make sure that you have that connection more than just once with those investors and you treat them like real friends. To take it a step further, you know, as I was joking around with all these founders with their iPad underneath their arms. They were all looking for marriage on the first date, and that's creepy, right? Because when you think about it, when you're raising capital from someone, it is a marriage, right? I mean, it is a marriage. You're with these people. There's an exchange of money, right? There's, you know, there there is a contract there, um, and a lot of people don't think about it that way. They just think of their investors as just being like needy or annoying or not. But I always make sure that I'm of service first. There are people who call me. They'll send something to me. I know I won't. They, I won't like it all, but I just have to be the no man to tell them no. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? <laughs> yeah. They'll be like, look, I know this isn't for you, but can you do me a favor? Um, can you look at this? It's for my brother-in-law. I don't really respect him. I'm just giving you the cliff notes, you know, and he's never been successful with anything. Can you just give me a reason not to invest in this? So I just write five reasons, you know, and then I'll be like, okay, thank you. Right. <laughs> 
but I'm serving them, you know, I'm, I'm helping them. And that's, that's important. Right. And that's, that's the most important part of it is you want to make sure that you're helping them. I've, I've helped people read, read their college essays, you know, rewrite their college essays sometimes. Um, and I've helped, you know, I've done some consulting for families too, who are looking to build their own family office and their own investment platforms using, you know, specialized SPV structures, fund structures, joint venture structures. And it's worked out really well, but it all comes down to one thing. If you are not building relationships actively with investors, you're not going anywhere. There's always going to be deals there. There's always going to be something there. And the last thing you want to do is go groveling to an investor when you have a great deal, when you don't have any sort of um, reputation with them or any sort of really relationship with them or track record, really. Right. Oh, that's that's great. That's absolutely golden. Sal, thank you for taking the time here to come on the show today. There's absolutely. Last question I have for you. You've got a new book coming out. I know you mentioned it there briefly, but just so we make sure we capture this here on the show, what's the title of it and where do we find it? Investing Legacy, how the 0.001% invest. This is all the sacred lambs that I've taken um, and it's slaughtered using and corroborating ex bosses at Goldman Sachs and you know even a Rockefeller that I sit on a board with with a, with a genius biotechnology in Boston. This is really how um, the, the bias is today. And as you're starting to see the bifurcation, unfortunately, in the country of wealth where there's no middle classes, it's the richer getting richer and the poor getting poorer. This is what people are really gravitating into. And there's really no mention of ETFs, but it talks about more or less the status of investments, like you know, owning a professional sports team or being the guy that all your friends behind your back say, oh, I know the guy that owns that office tower over there. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. And it, anyone who's raising money, it would be a good fundamental insight into the psyche of how and what drives a lot of these people because not all of them look like Warren Buffett and eat you know drink you know cherry cokes and and eat cheeseburgers there's five different avatars I talk about in the book and each one of them have different motivations and I highly recommend it to get the autographed version you go to investinglegacy.com forward slash book that's investinglegacy.com forward slash book um, and it also is available on audible as narrated by author myself um, so you can check it out there investinglegacy.com forward slash book and um, yeah people who buy the book will be automatically onboarded into our multifamily office platform so that you can actually see um, how we interact <laughs> with our investors so we'll treat you as an investor even if you're not one does that make sense that's awesome, Sal. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. We'll make sure to include that there in the show notes. Thanks again for coming on today. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sam. I appreciate you. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.